We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Centre for Global Development uh, in Europe. Um, and a particular welcome to our special guest, Sarah Champion MP. It's wonderful to have you here with us. Um, I'm Ian Mitchell. Um, I'm co-director of CGD's Europe programme. Um, and a big focus for us is, is looking at the UK as a development actor um, and how it can be effective and and we have a large research program on that. I think it probably wouldn't be a surprise or a shock to say that, that in that work, we think that the, the last few years have been um, quite disappointing on, on development policy, uh, the damaging merger um, of DFID and the Foreign Office, um, the significant cut in the aid budget, which was undertaken in, in six months effectively, um, and now the reallocation of the aid budget towards domestic costs and particularly refugees. So, I mean, I think the implications of, of that for us are, you know, understand the political context is very important and, and, and what happens on development policy, you know, is very political issue. So we have a series um, of, of discussions with, with leading political thinkers um, on the state of UK development and, and what we can expect um, for the future of UK development. And so we're very lucky to have um, an excellent speaker with us today. Sarah is, you know, widely respected um, as, an, as, a, as a leading thinker on development. And, and I think probably no one has followed UK development more closely mm -hmm. um, than, than you have in, in recent years. So I'm, I'm looking forward, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about UK development policy um, and maybe also speculating on what a possible incoming Labour government might do. Um, so thank you for joining us. But so before we get into the policy issues, um, I'm very interested in how you, you come to work on development in the first place. Um, what drew you to it? And, and maybe you can tell us as well how you, how you came to chair the uh, International Development Committee. Mm, um, well, first of all, thank you. And thank all of you for being here. It's, I, th I think it's more intimidating that I know most of the room. <laughs> Um, but also to say that um, I'm not Labour's front bench. I can't tell you what the policy is going to be, uh, but I can tell you the truth as I see it, um, which might be fun. <laughs> so how did I get into this? Um, I mean, I've been an MP now for uh, 10 years. Um, I'm very proud of my constituency, Rotherham, in South Yorkshire. Uh, it is a constituency that has been through really challenging times, compounded by government decisions which really haven't helped my constituents. Um, so, to be quite honest, uh, when it came to the 2019 elections, and uh, then after that in 2020, when it was an opportunity to put yourself forward to chair one of the select committees, and uh, the select committee uh, chairs are elected by the House. So this is a, I represent the whole House uh, in, in my role. Um, I thought, what would I really, really like to do? What, what would make me most proud? You know, when I'm sort of sat at home at 92, hopefully, uh, and look back, uh, what, what would I really think I've, I've made a difference? And for me, it was falling to my pet interest rather than a political campaigning interest, which is development and international development. And I think that comes from, I get very frustrated that um, politicians tell people what they 
ought to do and what they need rather than actually asking them what they want and how they can support them to get that. So this seemed the um, most extreme example of that. Uh, so to be able to add some value and scrutinise what the government is doing, because that's ultimately what my role is, to see you know where the government is or isn't spending their money. Uh, that was something that I felt very passionate about. Um, I didn't know within weeks of getting elected to chair the committee what was going to roll out from that <laughs> point. Um, I, but I'm always up for a fight, and thank God that I was. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think that will resonate with a lot of people here in, in terms of that motivation. That's very interesting. So I'm glad you mentioned your, your constituents, because that was something I wanted to ask you about. I mean, I think, you know, you as an MP, you have a reputation for, for working on child protection and for championing the steel and glass industries. There was, a, there was someone on Twitter yesterday who was wishing that you were the Glasgow MP <laughs> so that, they, that you could represent them. Um, how do you talk to constituents about your, your international role and uh, uh, what's their reaction to it? You know, I think we, we feel as though there's some scepticism among people about the UK's activity on development. So tell yeah, us a bit I, about I, how you I, interact I, with constituents. I absolutely challenge that. And I feel quite insulted that it has been played out that constituents like mine, which are labelled red wall constituents, um, so uh, mainly northern uh, sort of urban working class uh, constituencies, uh, don't like, don't get development. It, it's absolute nonsense. I mean, it, it, it genuinely is. And I, and I, I, I kind of think it's like, it's almost like they're saying uh, your people aren't sophisticated enough to understand the importance of this. Right. Um, and it really sticks in my craw, I've got to tell you. And the reality is, um, in my constituency, it's quite a diverse constituency. We've got uh, lots of different faith groups, all of whom are actively raising money, advocating, campaigning for people around the world. Uh, we've got uh, quite uh, to the different populations that I've got. Uh, remittances is a big part of what they do. And also they are a uh, very um, internationally outward looking community, uh, partly because they've got family abroad, but, but also because we are, you know, we're a small island, we're a small diverse island. So, so that sort of stigma that's laid on my doorstep, I find quite offensive. So, so I, I haven't, I think part of the problem when you're a, a chair of a committee is you do deep dive into one topic. So the criticism that I have is that I'm doing too much on international development and not enough locally. Um, that just means I work an 18 hour a day rather than a 12 hour day to try and combat that. And I get that, but I have never had a criticism for doing it. Um, people understand why it's important because to be quite blunt, poverty is poverty. And, and people understand the impact of poverty in my constituency and they don't want anybody else to go through it. So I was thinking coming here, sorry, I'm waffling. Um, before this, I used to run a, a children's hospice and I used to go around literally with the collecting tin. And the people that always put money in the tin were the people that were the very poorest in the communities. And the, the people who were obviously more affluent, they'd just walk by because you're an annoying tin rattler. And, and so I think it's the exact opposite. I think people care and they don't want anyone else to suffer like they have. Amazing. Very interesting. Very interesting. And, and, and you know, Andrew Mitchell's set this target to say, you know, we think it's the government's job to, to persuade people to support development. Where do you stand on, on that issue? Um, I, I agree. I think that um, there is, I mean, we've recently done uh, uh, an inquiry into atrocity prevention. And the reason that I did that, obviously our role is to scrutinize internationally, but also I was feeling locally here, the beginnings of othering um, that were then being backed up by media, that were then being backed up by policy decisions that, that leads to crimes against humanity. It leads to genocide in its most extreme. And, and I, I don't like that I was starting to see that in my country. And so I think there is a, a lot of work to be done to make people understand why doing the right thing by your neighbour is the right thing to do and benefits all of us. So I, I think there's a rebuild on that. Um, I, I think making the argument that um, development is a very, very good way of doing that uh, probably has become a little tenuous for some people. So making that connection more direct, I, I do think is right in that. 
Very interesting. Very interesting. So, I mean, you mentioned your forthcoming report on atrocities. I, so I, no, that, that, that's out. That one's out. We can, we can send a link to everyone. Very good. Very good. So I, I, because I'm a geek, I went back and looked at how many reports that the Org Committee had published since you'd been in, and, and it's at least 40, <laughs> maybe, maybe 41, which is, you know, which is remarkable. And they cover things from, I don't know, climate finance through to atrocities through to, um, you know, Sudan. Um, so looking back over that three year period or just over three years, I mean, what stand out, what stands out to you as the, as the biggest issues that you've, that you've looked at and, and, and what are the biggest issues for development now? Oh, that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, let me unpick that. So the first thing that, that I wanted to do when I came in as chair was to take a step back and to look at basically, I mean, we called it the philosophy of aid. Um, so why are we doing what we're doing? And I think that that always puts you in a very good position to go forward it, as effectively as you can. Um, that inquiry led us to do another one on racism in the aid sector. Uh, again, it was, it was one of those things that needs to be accepted, acknowledged and moved forward from. Um, and then everything we've sort of done since then is informed, I would say, by those two inquiries. Uh, I, I find the, the aid sector doesn't tend to do that. Sorry, everybody and everybody looking, doesn't <laughs> tend to do that reflection. I find policy people, and, and I'm talking government policy on all sides, uh, don't tend to take that step back and think, why are we doing what we're doing? what is the outcome we're trying to achieve? I think we're so busy delivering to the, the targets and the strategies and the commitments uh, that why you're doing it tends to get lost. So that that's the first part of your question. Tell me what the other two bits of it were. So, uh, yeah, I suppose, I suppose, how do you assess the period as a whole? You know, I mean, I think if you've mm. looked at those those 40 issues, you know, the government policy has changed, as we said at the, stop, at the start, you know, massively throughout. Um, what Perhaps what are the most problematic areas that you see or the what's your assessment of government policy over that period i have a list <laughs> <laughs> i wrote this down because um I, I i you forget how much has happened in three years so pandemic um the uk aid budget uh shrinking or because of gni the merger of the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office with DFID, the Development Office, uh, the attempt to close down my committee, the International Development Committee, and by association, ICAI, and we have ICAI people here, um, the loss of a cabinet level Minister for Development. That was all in 2020. Uh, 2021, publication of the Integrated Review, cut of spending from 0.7 to 0.5 2022 uh, so, sorry that was 2021 2022 uh, publication of the international development strategy renewed emphasis on bii uh, investment partnerships uh, reinstatement of cabinet level minister for development 2023 and we're only a couple of months in it <laughs> publication of refreshed integrated review uh, reinstatement of minister for development attending national security council and uh, Minister Mitchell's uh, Chatham House speech, where he is prioritising investment partnerships, women and girls and humanitarian resilience. I tell you this list because in that three year period, a lot of what we were doing was reactive. So a lot of it was uh, trying to make the case for why investing in development was a really key and important thing. Uh, a lot of it was trying to show the impact of uh, the merger and, and how that would affect our global standing. And I think since then, um, our global standing has been pretty much decimated. Um, I am talking to you as someone who is now embarrassed when I go abroad. So the committee is going to Washington next week and I know we will face a lot of criticism about why we have stepped away from our commitments. What, uh, you know, how, how dare we tell other countries what they ought to be doing on development? Uh, you know, why is it that, that we're no longer on the international stage? And also dealing with the, um, the organisations who, uh, you know, we had the... Um, UNFPA in front of us, we're doing a, an inquiry on sexual health 
and hearing the reality of having less than a week's notice that their funding was going to be cut. Uh, and we were one of the main funders for family planning internationally and the consequences of that and, and having to look those people in the eyes and, and say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I'm from the UK and that happened uh, while we were here. Um, I, I think a, a lot of what we've been trying to do is highlight where investment needs to go. So we've done an inquiry on um, climate change. Um, we're, we're doing one at the moment on development finance. So, so we accept that this is the pot of money that we've got, but let us highlight to you the choices that you're making in the real world, what are the consequences of that? We're also at the inquiries that we've done trying to um, highlight where there are um, inconsistencies uh, or where the emphasis hasn't been placed on things. So for example, it's great to have a, a headline, uh, women and girls, women and girls, women and girls, but, but actually what does that mean in process? What does that mean in practice? So how much of your money is going to specific women and girls schemes? Not that you're doing an education, you're, you've got a school that you're funding and so 50% of those children are going to be girls. That, that's not the same as a focus on women and girls. And you can look at somewhere like Afghanistan uh, to see the direct impact of um, what we do and don't do having on a population and how, how does government understand and accept and move forward from the inconsistencies that they're putting out on the world stage. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we find that dilemma now with, with, you know, getting the balance right between the UK still being a significant international actor, but but having made the decisions it has and, and the way that it's gone about those, you know, how can you realistically ask the UK to, to be a leader and to, to try and lead others or or does it need to be more humble for a period and, um, and, and follow others maybe? So, humble is always a good starting point, I think. Yeah. And can I also say that we have the most phenomenal civil service here and the development people around the world are trying to hold all of this together and do the best by the people that they are trying to serve and and hats off to them and it, it it's it is not a position that i would want anyone to be put in yeah absolutely um i should have said at the outset um people online could see how you can pose questions but if you're on twitter then it's hashtag cgd talks um, we're also on linkedin and youtube so please get your questions ready for, for when we come on to Q&A. If you're in the room, um, there'll, there'll be a microphone. Um, I, th I think that takes us on to, um, you know, I, I feel as hopefully we've, we've had the, the nadir in terms of UK development policy. Um, Andrew Mitchell's come in and, and he's made some, pro some progressive changes. Do you feel like uh, the UK government has now turned a corner on development and, mm -hmm. and that it's an upward trajectory or or is your assessment different from that? Um, so Andrew Mitchell, um, I, he, he's, he, the, the, the bizarre thing is um, Andrew and I work so closely together to fight the cuts and to save the International Development Committee. You know, he was absolutely phenomenal. He was uh, sort of the founder of ICAI. So he really, really went to the front line to make sure that ICAI was saved. And uh, and I, I, I can't speak for him, but from what he has said, um, he, he couldn't believe the disarray when he stepped into the ministerial role. And he has managed to, as one man, uh, make, it's not, it's not so much difference, it's, it's to, to bed down a holding position for development so that it still has its relevance, so that it still has the core structures, so that the staff have a degree of protection and respect that they deserve. And he has been amazing on that. I think he's also a realist. He was in front of our um, sort of committee and, you know, I'm a Labour politician. I am not a Conservative politician. So, you know, take all of this with that basis. But he was in front of our committee yesterday and was saying he's going to bring forward a, sort of a, a white paper soon. And, uh, and he knows that the paper is written as a long term paper in the hope that whoever is in government and uh, in a year, 18 months time will take that forward. So I think what he's trying to do is do that long term planning uh, and and get that in amongst government. But the problem that he's got is that whereas three years ago, 
the vast majority of ODA was being spent by DFID, uh, FCO, so DFID and FCDO. Now, um, we, we don't know the exact figure because it's proved almost impossible to bottom it out from the government, but uh, the Home Office is taking at least a third of what should be spent on international development to support refugees in this country. Um, and absolutely, we should be supporting refugees in this country, but I don't think we should be doing it at the expense of the poorest in the world for money that is very clearly designated for international development. So Andrew is a realist, but he has a very, very small pot of money now. Um, and it seems from our inquiry into this that the Treasury and the Home Office are the ones that are, that are running the show. So it's, it's a tough position that he's in, but, you know, huge credit to him for what he's done. Yeah, yeah. I must admit that's the thing that in, in you know, in five years of working on development, that, that, you know, the vote to cut the aid budget was, was done through Parliament. You know, none of us wanted it to happen. But, but in the end, that argument was won. I've had much more difficulty with the spending on refugees, which, which I think hasn't got a, a political mandate. And um, as you say, it's, it's Treasury and the Home Office that are, that are in charge of that. Um, I mean, so as and, you s and that further makes us an outlier. Yeah. Um, and and that that's what I find. I mean, that's where my embarrassment comes from, that we will yeah. we will talk one thing, you know, rule of law, uh, taking the moral high ground, all of this sort of stuff. But then in practice, we do the exact opposite, but expect other countries to do what we say, not what yeah. we do. That, that that sticks in my throat. Absolutely. too. So as you said at the start, you're not on the front bench. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for so don't pick on me. And, um, <laughs> I mean, I think Labour are in a policy development process, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me, but there are some statements out there on, on Labour policy. And uh, I mean, can you see clear light? I mean, Andrew Mitchell was trying to re-establish the consensus on development, but can you see clear daylight between what the Labour front bench have said on development and, and what we've got from this government and Andrew Mitchell at the moment? Um, I, I, I don't think uh, so. The, I'm, I'm going to separate that out a little bit. Um, I think that Andrew Mitchell's position and our front bench position are very similar. Um, and there may well be some synergy going on. Uh, what I would say is the government's position and Labour's position seem to be very, very different. Um, I am heartened by when Keir's asked his commitment to having a department. I am, uh, you know, I, I get the sector gets very caught up on this 0 0.7 of GNI number. Um, I'm much more interested in what our priorities are, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and then the money sort of flows on from that. So, you know, one year it might be 1.2 to reach the targets and another it might be 5%, that's 0.5% for example. So, so I don't, I don't particularly engage in that argument of getting back to 0.7, back to 0.7. Um, what I do think though, is we need to have um, a, a very clear ring fenced sort of policy um, control. Uh, I do think we need to have that ring fenced budget that's there. I do think that we need to have a cabinet member um, because for all the arguments we made when the, the merger came ahead, I mean, why why would you want to take tools out of your toolkit? Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an awful position that ambassadors are in, for example. So they might be trying to negotiate a trade deal at the same time as they're telling the governor of a state that they're cutting a school funding that, that is really, really important to them. Um, so to have two people making those arguments in a country seems a much more sensible approach to me. So I, I think that um, I think that that's where Labour's going. Uh, it's it's a process. You know, we try. I think sometimes we, we almost try to be too democratic about our process. So it, it, it can get quite stretched out over time. But we've got a national policy forum coming and then we've got conference. And then I hope we'll have a really clear statement but i mean from what Keir's saying i think i think it's pretty clear that he intends to have a development department yeah yeah I, i'm sure and i, I think uh, i mean I, i'm sure we will get questions about this um mm -hmm. afterwards but it always seems to me i mean i think if you're if you're the foreign secretary and, and you're going to cabinet and there's 20 or 24 people around that table to to be the only person speaking about international issues I think if you're the foreign secretary, you, it's helpful to have an ally there, um, you know, with an international perspective. So it will be interesting to, to, to see how that policy position evolves. Um, the other thing that um, uh, that we've heard about from the Labour Party a little bit is is the importance of climate, mm -hmm. and and I think um, I've got a background in the environment department, and you know, I, I think now we have a consensus that that climate is absolutely crucial to development. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's development. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but sometimes that manifests itself in, in development policy in a way, you know, probably you and I, Sarah, emit seven or eight tonnes per head, maybe more if we're flying internationally. You know, in the poorest 50 countries, it's probably hard, less than half a tonne mm. per head. But but it's sometimes easier to change our international policy and say, well, we won't fund fossil fuels overseas, we'll do it here. Mm. Um, and, you know, how do you see that? Do you, do you think that we should be um, saying to poor countries, look, we're not going to help you with fossil fuels? Mm. Or, or do you think there's some leeway um, for, for the poorest countries in the world to, to move along that development pathway? Um, I, I bring you back to our racism uh, inquiry. I, I find it deeply offensive that uh, when um, the global north has gone through all the industrial revolution, put all of this in the sky um, and uh, we, we are now able to afford to take a, a position um, and then tell other people what they ought and ought not be doing. Um, however, there is a, a direct reality of using <coughs> fossil fuel that we now know about. Uh, so something has to be done. What I would like to see is a sensible sort of transition with a lot of help and a lot of support. Um, there are ways that we could do more around carbon capture. There are ways that we could do more around uh, helping countries uh, with renewables. Um, but we we don't seem to do that. We seem to be more sort of tinkering around the edges and telling people again what they ought to be doing rather than giving them support um, for what it is that they want to do and what it is that they want to achieve. I think it's particularly obvious when we look at some of the environmental schemes where we're not asking people what works, what the problems are, and then giving them resources to manage it themselves. Um, I, I think there's a degree of arrogance around that, uh, and I do come back to the R word, I think there's a degree of racism around that, we know better than you. Um, so I really think going forwards, whoever's in government needs to take a pretty cold hard look at this and start asking people more about what needs to be done. But you're absolutely right, um, climate change now underpins everything to do with poverty, our lives, our futures, what we eat, how we eat, if we eat, uh, population migration, conflict. Uh, so unless we actually tackle the root cause of this, then the, we're just tampering around the edges, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, you're starting to touch there on, on issues, you know, using the jargon of the development sector, you know, localization, recipient voices, partnerships. And I mean, David Lammy's spoken about the need to think more about um, partnerships with, with countries. Uh, in that debate, there's, there's sometimes people, a suggestion that if you're, if you're building true partnerships, then first of all, maybe, maybe your focus on women and girls and climate, your own themes need to take a back seat. Um, and there's also a suggestion maybe that those, maybe having a true partnership approach isn't consistent with focusing on ex extreme poverty. Mm. Um, and I want to ask you about those two things. Do you, do you, can you imagine a government being comfortable not having a list of seven priorities because it prioritised partnership? And, and do you think that, you know, if, if, if there's a focus on extreme poverty, is that patronising? You know, is that outdated now? Um, I, I mean, it, no, because it's getting worse. Uh, I would have one focus, which is pretty much the odour focus with the, that definition, which is ending extreme poverty. I, I'm very comfortable with the sustainable development goals. I'm very comfortable that that ought to be our target. And that's what I mean. Everything flows from that. Um, where I'm less comfortable is actually with the partnership word, because um, offering money to partner with something that we think is important, I, I feel is the wrong approach. So if, you're, if your goal is to ex end extreme poverty, then go and ask the people in extreme poverty what they need and what, how we can best support them in doing that. I, th I, think it's, I think it's a supporting role that might lead to a future partnership, um, but, and it comes back to Rotherham and the constituency, um, I've always, always found if you ask people what the problem is, ask them for the solution and then give them the resources, they, they know what it is. It tends to be a lot simpler and it tends to be a lot cheaper and much more sustainable if you give them the money. And I would like us to go back to that position. And I, it, it's a mind shift that people need to change here. So 
it, it might be that women and girls is the the focus it might be you know I'm, I'm not saying that we throw away our, our morals and our principles and you know I mean maybe a country uh, for them eradicating the LGBT community is their main goal I mean and why on earth will he be supporting something like that um, but what I am saying is uh, go to the harder to reach people you know ask the marginalized communities ask people with disabilities and yes ask women and girls as your starting point what needs to change and and then start building up from that rather than this telling that we constantly seem to do and we've got money so you know if we're offering people money to do a women and girls project they'll do a women and girls project but i was in um, nepal a few months ago and uh, looking at some um, street children that we've been working with and they were saying oh it's great you know we have um all these NGOs come in and they give us schemes. So they give us um, hairdressing and uh, sewing schemes uh, for for girls to get a career. And this woman said, but I really wanted to be a beautician and I don't want to be a hairdresser and a seamstress. I want to be a beautician. There's nothing. So unless I take those, I then don't have a future. And you just think, mm, why couldn't we have asked what people needed and, and yeah. facilitated that? Yeah, I, I think this is one of the themes that we've tried to to raise the profile of. I think you know there are there are surveys of recipients uh, at, at official policy level rather than you know um, necessarily people that are affected directly, and and the UK scores quite poorly in those for the ownership of the countries we're working with, which is you know which is surprising given the size of the amounts of money concerned mm -hmm. and you know the UK's reputation for for working with the poorest countries. So I, I do think that's a, a really important point. I think it's about trust. I think right. it's about respect. And I think it's about giving them a seat on the board. Do yeah. you know what I mean? It's, it's take a step back. Yeah. Why is it you're doing what you're doing? And Absolutely. what's the best way to achieve that? Absolutely. So like any conversation about development in the UK, we, we focused a, a bit, uh, maybe a bit too much on the finance and, and the money. Um, so So maybe let's talk a little bit about policies beyond finance mm -hmm. and aid. And um, so one story in the news this week was um, Ghanaian nurses coming to the UK mm. um, and leaving, you know, uh, potentially leaving shortfalls of nurses in Ghana, a country struggling with, with high levels of debt. Um, so, I mean, uh, CGD has published quite a lot of work arguing that, you know, migration is a, uh, an important development pathway and that maybe if those nurses couldn't come to the UK there'd be fewer nurses in Ghana because mm -hmm. they wouldn't train mm -hmm. so we're certainly my colleagues and and, I, and myself are, are sympathetic to, to migration but do you see do you see that as an important part of the UK's uh, policy approach and and do you think there needs to be more formalization of the, the funding of training of nurses in Ghana and, and those sorts of policies well, I think there ought to be more investment in um, funding nurses to train in the UK as a starting point. Um, but it's also a global thing. So um, a friend of mine, his wife, uh, she's 50, has just qualified as a registered nurse. And within three days, she got a letter from the Australian embassy offering a job over there. So I think this is a global thing that's right. happening. Um, I spoke to uh, a friend who's a Jamaican parliamentarian, uh, and we're blessed a lot of... Um, in, in sort of the, the recent past, uh, we, we got a lot of nurses um, from the Caribbean, and thank goodness that we did. Um, and I was saying to him, you know, well, what, what's the solution? And his solution is, well, why doesn't the UK look at doing um, joint training, uh, whether it's in the UK or, or in Jamaica? Um, there is a six year um, deal that you can come and work in the UK if you want, uh, but also that UK nurses could go and work in Jamaica if they want. And and I think I really like that as an idea. Um, you know, it's recognising that uh, there are skills that we all need. Uh, it's recognising that supporting people with the training of those skills to benefit both countries is, is a good partnership. Yeah. Um, but it, it's also not um, sort of stripping away the skills that a country needs itself. Um, I remember being in Bali on holiday and uh, was told, you know, one of the, the biggest problems that Bali's got is everybody works on the cruise ships because that's the only way to get enough money to send back for the families so that they can live. And you suddenly think, wow, you know, that that's a real impact on, on a small country. Yeah. So we, we have to accept that we're in a global world. Uh, celebrate that people might want to work in different countries for a period of time I mean, that's a great thing i mean it, it benefits all of us but that's the thing make sure it does benefit all of us it's not at the expense of one or the other yeah, yeah. 
Thank you. A quick plug for um, Helen Dempster's work on, on this with Michael Clemens. And I think there's something about having those, uh, it goes back to what you were saying at the start and having a clear story to tell to constituents. Mm -hmm. And on, I think it's easier when there's a, there's a an agreement that goes both ways mm -hmm. and there's opportunities Can I do one? for both. You've no, done a plug. Do. Can I do a plug? Please do. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really pleased we've done a report on the um, impact on host countries of uh, long-term refugees and we focused on Jordan and Lebanon. And uh, what happens is uh, the international community is very good at that immediate humanitarian support. Um, but I, I can't remember the figure. I think it's something like the average uh, sort of refugee is in the host country for five or seven years, something like that. It's a long term. Um, and we know that. Uh, and we start stepping away from that long term developmental support. So Jordan, for example, um, is getting roughly about 10 percent of the money that it needs to host largely sort of Palestinian and Syrian refugees. It's having a direct impact on their economy, uh, on their um, uh, in, unemployment and they've got 60 percent uh, unemployment of graduates at the moment um, so I've put the Jordanian ambassador in touch with the chief exec of Rotherham Hospital and they're finding a way to work together so that the nurses and doctors can get employment but in a sustainable way so I mean it's it's doable we can do this right. if there's the will to do it yeah yeah, and the, the Jordan example, you know, the, the volumes of people that they've had to deal with and, and have oh, done so is, you incredible. know, dwarfs the 200,000. And have done uh, it without, it's about that sort of a good third of their population are refugees. Um, yeah. I think it's 96% of them are living within the communities. Right. Um, they're genuinely isn't sort of hatred resentment it's uh, and they were they were incredulous when i kept on asking you know is, isn't there any hostility and it's like why these people need our help why wouldn't we help them right. i'm like yeah it's a fair point <laughs> yeah brilliant brilliant so we're almost ready to, to take some questions from our audience uh, so one one final question for me for you uh it goes back to to the labor party and, and the labor party manifesto and, mm -hmm. and you've been quite clear about you know we should have a clear objective for, for our development policy before we start talking about metrics or organisational forms. But what would your wish list be for that Labour Party manifesto on development? What would you like to see, you know, going to the next election, the Labour Party arguing for on development? Um, from day one, we could have a development department. We have got the skills. It doesn't cost additional money. The skill is there. So this it's much more about a positioning thing. I don't need new buildings. I don't need standalone anything. What I need is a ring-fenced budget and policy and a seat at the top table. Um, so we need to do that. Um, we've said it already. I mean, extreme poverty, for me, has to be the absolute core of everything that we're doing. Um, and then the secondary thing is how do we make sure the voice of the people that we're trying to serve is absolutely central to everything we do? Um, I, I think from that, the, the details, everybody in the room and listening to this know more about it than I do about what the priorities should be. But, but if we get those core things right, then I genuinely think we can get back to being one of the global superpowers when it comes to development that, that for a very small amount of money for unknown to me reasons we've given away in recent years yeah absolutely very clear answer thank you so let's open this up um i've got a couple of questions uh coming through i've got one question here hunter please and and then mark thank you. here thanks very much um neil briscoe head of policy at wilton park an arm's length body of the fcdo i'd be interested in your views on the impact of geopolitics on mm -hmm. development whether it's u.s retrenchment chinese expansionism russian disruption what worries you most? Um, I mean, what, what worries me most is that this government have given away our soft power, which was a very, very real power, and that others have literally, you know, it's, it's, it's like water poured straight into that vacuum that we have created. Uh, I've just come from a meeting with the World Service, and they said that now 75% of the world media is state-run. And they gave the example of the countries that we have withdrawn the world service from that are now getting their sources from Russia and China predominantly. Um, that's something that should concern all of us um, because the amount of disinformation that is going out because of that and the direct impact that it's likely to have on our shores is a very real thing. 
it, it also concerns me that um, in the first integrated review, there was no real mention of Africa. Um, there was a, 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 a slightly odd Indo-Pacific tilt, but without really justification of why. And I think we need to be doing much more. So Ukraine was completely missed from it. I mean, that wasn't on the radar at all. Uh, I, th I think we need to be much more attuned to where conflict around the world is starting. I mean, that's why I was obsessed about atrocity prevention, because there are very clear signs. And uh, Sudan would be the perfect example. Um, you know, the, the civil society knew for a long time that things were going horribly wrong, but we chose to ignore that. And uh, with inevitable and devastating consequences. And my concern is that, that we're ignoring a lot of things around the world uh, with a denial that it will ever end up on our shores. And, and I think that that's quite a dangerous game to be playing. Thank you. I can I can see. Let's have Tamsin, who's intercepted the microphone on its way to the But uh, it's in the interest of uh, gender balance, that works very well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Thank you. Tamsin Barton, Independent Commission for Aid Impact. And it's been brilliant listening to you reflecting on this period of scrutiny uh, and you've highlighted the way in which you saved this you know, very key figure in saving the scrutiny architecture. Uh, so I thought I'd just ask you to reflect a bit more on what you'll think when you're 92 um, <laughs> about that period and anything you're particularly proud of and how imagining one day you might be on the front bench, how you would work with the chair of the select committee scrutinising you and of course ICAI. Mm. Um, I mean, I think when I'm 92, my main priority would be why does my back hurt so much? Um, but looking, I mean, it, it pains me that we couldn't stop the merger. It, it pains me that we couldn't get logic for where the cuts were falling um, because an awful, awful lot of damage and indeed death has resulted in that. Um, I now completely understand why they wanted to get rid of my committee and, and your scrutiny uh, commission. Um, and I think, thank goodness to all of the NGOs, the constituents, the MPs that fought a pretty bloody battle to, to keep both in place. Um, I, I know that where we have looked at things uh we have been able to make a difference so i don't think we've we've published the letter yet but the government have now agreed to a global health strategy and cite the work that our committee has done to make that argument so i'm really really proud of that um i'm really proud that we got into the public domain how much money the home office how much odor money the home office was spending um so so i do see very real wins that we've made um, and and it's it's also you know it's when I talk to organisations and we're told when the committee had had a session uh, that they got treated with a little bit more respect or there was a little bit more understanding about the importance of the work that they were doing that that's a good feeling. Great, thank you. So Mark and then Romilly and then another question here. Uh, but thank you, Sarah, for coming and talking to us, but especially for how you're playing your role. I think we're all incredibly grateful <laughs> to you for the way you're doing it in a difficult period. Uh, now, I think I know roughly where you are on this. And in fact, you've said things that Preet Gill, when she was sitting on exactly your chair a few weeks ago, coming to talk to us, said. But it's about the organisation arrangements, because one of the things that if we want to restore our reputation, we need to address is the organisation arrangements. And uh, as you say, Keir Starmer has been very clear but there's also been some slightly less clear statements. Mm. There were some suggestions, hints at the uh, weekend, for example, that maybe the solution is to recreate the Overseas Development Administration. And lots of people are finding it hard to square that with what Labour says it wants to do, that Labour says it wants something that's a new model. The ODA is not a new model. There were good reasons for getting rid of it in 97. We're about to publish a paper explaining what they were. Labour says it wants something independent. The ODA's biggest problem was it was not independent. It was it was overruled on the Pergam Dam and hundreds of other yeah, things. Yeah, good example. And then um, is would recreating the ODA rebuild the UK's international reputation? Now I worked for for twelve years for the ODA. Lots of my friends in the room did as well, and nobody would have said Britain was a leader in international development at that time. So 
can we just please nail the canar that bringing back the ODA is, is, is a cognitive dissonance <laughs> with the things Labour said it wants to do? And why do you think that discussion is going on? Is it simply uh, as a matter of going through the options in, as a reasonable opposition would do, or is there something else going on? Oh, you know, at the beginning, I said I'd tell you the truth. <laughs> Can I retract? <laughs> um, so I would tell you my opinion, um, which is I, ha I have, I mean, aside from Rob Merrick, who sat behind you, I have no idea where this sort of agency model came from. I hadn't heard it. Uh, I know that, that Rob's a good journo, so he'll have got his sources. Um, but I hadn't heard this discussed before. Um, I. I know that it was something that we very actively got rid of in 97 um, because it wasn't working. Um, I was told last night that apparently it, it came in under Thatcher in 79. Um, so why we would want to, as a, as a Labour government, bring back that just for that reason, I'm not quite sure. Um, and I, it's also the cost of it. I mean, we would have to be, it, and it's both the cost of it and the lag of being effective. That, to me, seems like creating something new. I mean, the, the thing that um, Andrew Mitchell has done and, and also the, um, the development team in FCDO have done is they have kept their expertise largely. Um, so we have a really skilled group of people. What they haven't got is the money to actually implement the projects that they want to do. So it just seems quite a straightforward thing to me to um, give them that space to be able to do that give them the cash uh and and just get on with it because you can literally do that from day one um you know i mean I, i'm really not bothered about what the the stationery has what i'm bothered about is the autonomy of those development staff um and that i i mean i you you, you say that you know well, well yes key has been saying that i mean he is the gaffer you know that is our boss saying that on record so as as far as i'm concerned if that's what the leader of the labor party is saying we'll be doing in government that's what we'll be doing all right thank you um just before we come to romilly um do please keep the questions coming in online we've had a couple which um have been picked up so we'll go but for people in the room romilly rob and then renil Romilly, Rob and Renil, it sort of sounds like a pop group. Um, thanks, Sarah. This is, uh, I'm not going to sing, no, I'm not offering. Um, I've got two questions. I was very interested in one of the recommendations on the aid spending inside the UK report about saying we should have a new target of 0.5, I think it was, outside of the UK. And we did the sums, and that you get you to actually at least 0.7, if not more, given the amount that we're spending on mm -hmm. refugees. And I feel like that hasn't been kind of talked about very much. Um, and I wanted to know what your advice was. Is that something a civil society? you think we should be picking up if not i think we do sometimes get a bit stuck on this refugee spending argument because of course it is in the dac rules and we all respect the DAC rules. technically and we, technically within the dac rules so we all know the uk is absolutely stretching the rules to mm. to the limit but i think that's where we've got a little bit stuck is like because it's in the rules so um all and any advice welcome mm -hmm. The second question I had was around the sort of international picture and the Bridgetown initiative, mm -hmm. because obviously we've got this big event in two weeks time mm -hmm. in Paris hosted by President Macron. So as we know, Rishi Sunak is not planning to go, despite the fact that many of the other world leaders, Chinese leader, German leader, uh, many African presidents will be there. Rishi Sunak will not be there as far as we know. So you didn't talk very much around the sort of international architecture, but that does seem an area where actually there, there could be quite a good alignment between Labour and, and Conservative positions. And is that an area we should be working more on? Thanks. Uh, so in uh, so, so the first one first. Uh, yeah, you're right. It hasn't had any pick up. Uh, what was really interesting about that report. So we, we brought in uh, Home Office, Treasury and FCDO, and they have um, sort of six to eight weeks to reply to our report. Uh, and it was the Treasury that replied to our report, which we were very surprised at that they now seem to be making the decisions over where development money is spent. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, that was our attempt of, of, of trying to get it back to the intent of the rules rather than the letter of the rules. Um, in terms of Bridgetown, we're actually, um, the committee is going out to Washington next week specifically to look at um, atrocity prevention and debt relief. Um, I can't say too much because in a few hours, our report on debt relief is coming out. Uh, but but basically, uh, it, it's very 
sort of clear to us that uh, the UK needs to be doing much more to um, make the private sector do the right thing uh, when it comes to debt relief. And it, the figures that are in the report, I mean, it's it's chilling uh, how much we are, and I use the word deliberately, shackling countries around the world to private investors um, at the expense of their education, of their health care, um, uh, I mean, their economy full stop, to be quite honest. So, uh, And the UK does have a role that it could be playing very directly in that because most of the legislation falls under either the UK or the US. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I will be, it, it's a really, really good report. Uh, and uh, we are working in Parliament in a cross-party way, uh, so hopefully there will be a debate coming soon in the floor of the House on the Bridgetown Initiative. And um, it, it's something, I mean, it, it's not perfect, but it seems a very practical thing that we ought to be doing internationally. Very good, very good. Uh, Rob? From can you introduce yourself as well? Uh, I, I keep forgetting to ask people that. But, uh... I'll, give you an ask. I'll let someone else take the floor. I'm uh, Rob Merrick, just taking over as the uh, UK correspondent for DevEx. Great. Thank you. We've got, we've got a microphone all this episode already. So, Renil. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, I just want to echo Mark's earlier. Uh, Sorry, I'm Ronald Snyder, uh, senior fellow from uh, Centre for Global Development. Um, I Just to echo Mark's thanks for the way you're doing your role. It's been um, I've been following, you know, all of the inquiries for the last uh, couple of years. They're very impressive. It's been striking me as increasingly difficult to get straight answers about where the aid money is going, what the policies are, and so on. So I just want to ask really what sort of what are the key things that you want to know about how the government is discharging its development function that you haven't been able to get an answer on yet? Like what information is what information do you need? Um, I mean, we just need the figures. Just give us the figures. That's what we asked for. I mean, we took as a really big win that, uh, so going back to Tamsin's question, uh, that we managed to get the um, the government to publish five lines on its ODA spend rather than three. Um, and it's just like, so why is it that we can't get the breakdown? You know, what? why can we not interrogate the money? And it's because they don't want us to. And and that, when it is, it is taxpayers' money after all, um, and it is our job to scrutinise that. Um, not giving us the figures really, really ties our hands in our role. Yeah, we know the feeling. Um, <laughs> question here from Richard. Hello, I'm Richard Darlington from the Aid Alliance. Sarah, you were very clear um, about wanting to see an independent department led by a Secretary of State and Cabinet from day one. Um, you also talked about Andrew Mitchell's role in terms of saving um, the committee and mm -hmm. ICAI and the strength of feeling that parliamentary opinion played in that decision. I don't know if people remember, there's no necessary not necessarily why they should, but I think Dominic Raab actually sent you a letter which you then published, which <laughs> told you to wrap up your inquiries by Christmas because you were going to be shut down. Yeah. And I just wonder, um, given the strength of parliamentary opinion on, on, on that decision not happening, what reflection do you have in terms of what the parliamentary opinion is in the parliamentary Labour Party at the moment about whether an independent department is the best, um, uh, the best way to, for mm -hmm. Labour to do this in government? Um, yeah, I, I got the letter and, and politely told him thank you very much for his opinion, but he had no sway over it because it was a house matter. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was bold of him, I have to say. Um, I, again, uh, I the direction of travel, I thought until the weekend was going for this sort of development department. I mean, that that's what I thought had been agreed. I hadn't heard any dissenting voices on that. Um, so I, again, when this sort of curveball of an agency and creating something new came out, uh, it, it knocked me for six. Um, I mean, not least as it would make us a complete outlier with the sort of the G7 as well as the cost. Um, so I am I am working on the principle that is, is misunderstanding um, because that's not what I'm hearing from my colleagues. And Sarah, could I just build on that with another question? Because we've had one online, which is related and says, you know, um, I mean, let's imagine a situation where 
there isn't a separate development department mm. after the election, whether it's a Conservative government or mm. the um, Labour. Could Labour we doesn't imagine it's a Labour government, please? Uh, <laughs> the Labour <laughs> government and uh, no separate <laughs> development department. What, what implicate? How does that work with the Development Select Committee and its work? It, it's a matter for Parliament, but in practice, what? what um, I mean, this is what this is what our, this is the misunderstanding that uh, Rob had. Uh, he thought that we scrutinise DFID. What we scrutinise is the money, so the where the ODA spend is, and uh, I, I can't back to the Home Office spend. Uh, had we only been able to scrutinise development, we would not have had reach to challenge the Home Office over its excessive spending. Uh, what's happened now is this shift um, and sort of the dilution of the money through the departments uh, it, it is still going at a pace. So the fact that we could call in Bays or whatever it's called today, um, defence or, or wherever, um, and hold them to account for that money. I think that that's really important. And what we're finding is um, the departments, uh, so Home Office particularly, don't necessarily have the, um, I mean, it's quite a geeky, in-depth understanding of the ODA rules. Um, so we're concerned, we've, we've currently got an argument going at the moment, because um, we know that the Treasury are paying VAT on hotels that they're putting uh, refugees in. Um, and we're trying to find out if they're putting the VAT against the ODA spend, which then means that they're making money basically right. out of ODA. So, uh, and, and unless you have those specialisms, and we remember we used to be sort of voted the most transparent department on ODA spend, uh, and we have plummeted dramatically. Um, so, so there needs to be that role wherever that money is. So it's not a departmental thing. It's a money thing that we're following. Yeah, very interesting. I, I mean, I, that's much more clearly established now than it was five years ago, where I think that was an ambiguity. So I think that's, I mean, that's a very small silver lining, perhaps, of some of the spending by other um, departments. I, I'm glad you're on the case with refugees and tax, because I mean, the, one of the things is, there's some quite remarkable figures about the, the proportion of Ukrainian refugees that are working already. Mm -hmm. And so it, it seems very plausible to me that the, you know, depending on how much the money the, the government has charged to the ODA budget for receiving Ukrainian refugees, it, it seems to be plausible that they would have paid more in tax mm -hmm. um, than has been than has been spent. And on, this is on why I get frustrated it. with the, um, the sort of the fixation on 0 0.7, because um, there may well be reasons to go above that. Whereas if you've sort of set that as a ceiling, um, then you're yeah. stopping uh, some really good things from happening. And why would you yeah, want to do absolutely. that? Absolutely. I mean, the, yeah, the, 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 the treatment of either the 0.5 or the 0.7 as a ceiling, I just think is, is crazy. And I don't know how that, how that got established in, in practice. It's, Accountants. It's, it's very, very frustration. Yeah. yeah. I'm an economist. It's a bit close to home. <laughs> so, uh, uh, very good. So, um, we've got another question down here. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, Robert Yates from the Centre for Union of Self Health at uh, Chatham House. Um, I'm just back from the World Health Assembly where, and I attended the Commonwealth Health Ministers meeting where many ministers are absolutely incandescent at the, the West letting down developing countries during the pandemic. And of course, as you've been saying, that since then things have got worse. I mean, aid financing to health has been slashed, mm. um, not only here, but, you know, Sweden, Germany, Japan. And there was a real sort of sense that things are changing big time um, in international health at the moment. Do you think that, I mean, that's obviously terrible, but I mean, do you think this is potentially an opportunity for us to be putting greater emphasis on leveraging domestic financing, uh, spending on health and education in developing countries? Now, that would mean sort of tackling things like sort of uh, um, debt relief and uh, tax havens and um, taxing natural resources properly. But there's just a feeling in global health at the moment. I think the golden era of aid financing is is over, mm -hmm. and that we need to get more realistic about this and switch to domestic financing. Mm -hmm. um, we did a report into uh, the impacts of COVID um, on um, lower income countries, and the thing that people kept on saying is, uh, "You're obsessed with this." Uh, we're not as obsessed. This is just another thing that's going to kill us. And actually, famine is is a much more pressing issue for us right now. Um, so I, I think we have to always ask what is the most important thing. But I come back to the discussion that we were having about nurses. I mean, what what an amazing thing it would be if we had a um, training center for nurses in, I don't know, Ghana, um, and our nurses could go out and work out there, um, and their nurses could come and work here. Uh, the skills that we could have, 
that would be such a such a benefit to everybody. So what I would like is us to get a little bit more creative about how we deal with these problems. So rather than it being sort of a, a, a benefactor type relationship, try and find something that is mutually beneficial for us. And, and I just, so we, I said extreme poverty. So extreme poverty uh, and global health, uh, I, I mean, it, it, it has to underpin anything. And I don't, I don't understand why after having a global pandemic, uh, we don't understand that, that these illnesses catch us all um, and why we're not investing but but most um, sort of low income countries it, it seems that their health system has been hollowed out partly by us stepping away but also the consequences of what's been going on yeah absolutely so um, our time is almost up so let me just say uh, thank you to those online joining us. I, I think we covered the questions that were posed in, in the answers. Um, on your screen, you can scan a QR code so that you will receive um, our newsletter and our reports. One of those coming imminently is from Renil Desanayaki uh, and Mark <coughs> Lowcock on why DIFID was created, which I think you'll agree is a, a timely contribution. <laughs> um, those of you in the room, you have the QR codes on your seat and you can scan them. Um, please stick around for coffee. Um, and let me finish up by saying a massive thank you to Sarah Champion. Um, I'd echo what people have said about your hard work and Just uh, let me see, say I have an amazing committee team that actually does the hard work and I just sit here and say what they tell me to. Excellent, excellent. I, I should say thank you as well to the team here that have made this happen because there's a lot of effort goes into um, setting up these events. So thank you so much for your time and, and your hard work and um, please keep at it and keep holding the government to account. <laughs>